we're streaming now just so everybody knows. Thank you. I was just about to say that. <laughs> I just it just popped up on my phone. Hey, good evening, everyone. Good evening. Hey, good evening. Good evening. Zalby, you don't have that distracting flashing candle in the background tonight. No, actually, I had someone like tell me that when they were watching like the recording of this, they couldn't stop looking at the lights. I was like, okay, maybe I should actually figure that out this time. It's a secret trick. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll hold the button whenever we need it. <laughs> Looks like the gang's all here. Do I have that right? Okay, well, in that case, um, I'm gonna call this uh, February 1st meeting of council committees uh, to order. Good evening, everyone. Um, we begin with calling the roll of members. Mr. Harris. Yes, Mr. President. Mr. Royo. Here. Ms. Baker? Here. Ms. Craig? Here. Ms. Diaz? Here. Mr. Garcia Molina? Here. Mr. Soto? Here. And President Smith Waydell? Here. All right, we'll move then to the approval of the January 4th committee meeting minutes. Motion to approve. Second. Okay, we got a motion and a. Uh, Motion and a second. Council comments? Okay, hearing none, Mr. Harris. Mr. Royo. Aye. Ms. Baker? Aye. Ms. Craig? Aye. Ms. Diaz? Aye. Mr. Garcia Molina? Aye. Mr. Soto? Aye. And President Smith Waydale? Aye. All right, we have approved the minutes. Um, a lot of items on the agenda tonight. Um, and we actually have a very healthy uh, personnel committee meeting. So I will turn it over to Councillor Diaz. The floor is yours. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Mr. President, we do have a lot. I'm gonna start with uh, making a motion with these um, members that will be on the Human Relations um, Commission Board. And I want to just read them all off and then we'll bring them in if they want to speak, if that's okay with everyone. So we have Ahmad Ahmad, Alyssa Anderson, Kyra Chatois, Shane Fielder, or Fillard, um, Katrina, Holmes and Lee Magarum, Whitney Lupton, and uh, let's see, Stature. And that would be all the ones that will be new to the Human Relations Board. So, do we want to start with um, having the first? Person, I'm not. Yeah, Ahmad Ahmad is on here. So if if you want to bring him into the room, into Zoom.
Welcome. Good evening, everyone. Hi. Good evening. So um, uh, I would like to be on the Human Relations Commission board because, you know, I'm uh, a proud Lancastrian and someone who loves the city and, you know, somebody who really cares deeply about diversity and making sure not only government remains accessible to all uh, of our neighbors, but also make sure that um, education and uh, fair wages and uh, equal opportunities in the job sector um, also remain a top priority of our city government. Um, you know, as somebody who uh, came to Lancaster as a refugee, it would be an honor to uh, serve a community that's done so much for us. Thank you. Is there any questions from the committee? Uh, Councilor Diaz, not a question, but just a thank you, Ahmed. Um, I know that your role in the refugee community, you've done some really great work in advocating uh, for the place in refugees in our community. And um, I think that this is a really, really good fit. Having some experience um, in the work in the board of the Human Relations Commission, I think that um, reading your resume and, and the work that you've done through volunteering with CWS, this seems like a good fit. So I appreciate you, your willingness to serve. Thank you. Any Thank questions you. from full council? No, I also, Councilor Diaz, just want to reiterate, uh, Ahmed, how we are the privileged ones, honestly, to have your perspective in city government. And I'm really excited to get you on board. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. And I would like to then move this to our next meeting, which will be next Tuesday. All in favor? Well, did, did somebody approve the motion, first motion? I'll second that motion. Okay, and can we move it forward then? All in favor? Aye. Okay, the next person would be then uh, Alyssa Anderson, if she's on. I hear something, but I don't know if that's her. Hey, yeah, sorry. It booted me off, uh, I think, for a second when it brought me on, but I'm back now. Okay, well, um, if you want to address City Council um, in regards to being in the Human Relations Board. Yeah, so um, I've actually been aware of and interested in the Human Relations Board uh, for a few years now. Um, I spoke um, just kind of publicly when I was doing advocacy work at CWS when I was working there. And um, I found out that Matt Johnson was speaking the following week about the Human Relations Commission, which sort of made me aware of it. So it's just something I've been wanting to be a part of for a while. And then the opportunity kind of uh, presented itself. Um, so I've, you know, I've been a Lancastrian for over 10 years now, um, I've done work with Church World Service. I've also done work um, with Agency with Choice, um, which also worked hand in hand a bit with DHGS. So I've been involved in the community for a good number of years now and um, just something I would look forward to, um, you know, furthering, you know, the interests of the community and making sure it's an equitable place to live. Any questions from the committee? Uh, I just uh, wanted to make a, a quick statement. Alyssa, thank you for being here this evening. I was reviewing um, uh, your letter of interest and, and your background, and I thought it was really great that it looks like you do a lot of work in moderating uh, and recording of meetings uh, in your current role. And I think that um, if that is something that interests you and that serves the board, that that would be um, a really great asset to have on the board. Yeah, if that's a need the board has, I'd be happy to fulfill it. It's definitely something I have experience with. Okay, any the policy nerd, I appreciate the, I appreciate that. Anything else uh, for Alyssa today? No, I just want to thank you, Alyssa. We actually just miss each other at CWS, but I've heard great things mm -hmm. about all the contributions that you make uh, kind of in any programs or work that you're doing. So I'm just really grateful. Thank you. 
if I may, Councillor Diaz, uh, just a quick thank you to Alyssa. <clears throat> thank you for serving and always glad to see a fellow shaper uh, getting civically engaged. So good to see you. Any other council members? Okay, the motion's on the table. Second. All in favor to moving this to next Tuesday? Aye. Alyssa, thank you again. And um, I hope you do extra, extra Nori. Great work. I know you will. <laughs> thank you. And then um, I guess we'll move over to, um, I'm going to say, is it Kyra or Kira Chatois? I don't know that I see her name on the list. She did not respond to the uh, the email that I'd sent asking her to attend. Okay. Yeah, I'm not seeing that name. Okay, so should we get that motion then um, approved? <clears throat> second. I would second that motion after reviewing. Mm -hmm. Okay, and we'll go ahead and move it forward to next Tuesday. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Um, is Shane Shane there? Sorry, what, what was that name? Sean. Sean. Oh, Sean. Sean. Okay, here we go. Phil Dillon. Yeah. Good evening, everybody. Hi. Hi. Hi, thank you for the opportunity to even uh, apply for this. This has been a really cool learning situation for me. Um, I've been in the area for going on six years now. Uh, I went to Elizabethtown College. I'm a Blue Jay grad. And uh, three years ago, I moved out to Lancaster City because I couldn't get away from the place. I fell in love with downtown and wanted to do everything I could to get more involved. And uh, I looked towards civic duty and trying to understand where I fit the best. Um, and I found that the position that I currently serve in at Deloitte working in the public sector and uh, working with state, local, and uh, higher education institutions and staffing could be a really perfect fit for this, for this position. So really excited and I feel really energized and passionate about the work that this does, uh, this board does and hoping I can make a difference. And do we have any questions then from the committee? Sean, I just appreciate your enthusiasm for wanting to serve. Um, this is a really, I think a really important board. I may be a little biased, but um, there's the, the need to have someone that can be an advocate and be out in the community and, and communicate with others is really, really important. So we need as many strong voices as possible. So I appreciate you wanting to do this. Thank you so much. Any questions from full council? Motion on the table, who can approve it? Second. And we'll move this then to next Tuesday. Is everyone in favor? Aye. Aye. Great, thank you so much for coming. And um, we'll move this forward to next Tuesday for a full vote. To, if you wanna stop back, just, just come on. And we have Mrs. Holmes. I don't see what is Trina the, on the. Oh, I see there. a Trina H there. Oh. That must be her, yeah. Good catch. <laughs> yes, hello. Sorry, I should have changed my name for you. <laughs> How you doing? Hi, good evening, everyone. I just wanted to say um, thank you all so much for consideration tonight. Um, I love working in the community, have been for a very long time. I'm originally from Camden. We moved here about um, 10, 11 years ago now. And so I've just been really active with mostly the school district of Lancaster. So stepping out of that realm would be really um, nice and interesting for me. Uh, right now I'm working with the equity steering committee at the district. And I think bringing some of the information that I'm learning there to the table would be very helpful. Um, so yeah, I just really look forward to being able to help. Um, any, any questions from the committee at all? 
I just have a quick comment, Councillor Diaz. I am really grateful that you're here today because one of the things that we have spoken about is that we need to bridge city council with the school board. And I think the work that you're doing with equity uh, with the school district is really gonna tie in well. And I think you're gonna find that there's some balances and then we'll really rely on you to kind of help us bridge that. So I appreciate it. Beautiful, thank you. I completely agree. I think that there's a, a really key connection between the school district commission and board um, and just in there in the communication piece and just and getting more people to be aware of it it's really important so I was really excited to see that on your resume mm. anyone else from full council wants to say anything or questions okay then um, if we can the motion is on the table Second. so Okay, and then we can move this to full council next Tuesday. All in favor? Aye. Thank you so much, Trina. And the next one would be Leah Magarum. Magarum. I think I did see Leah on the list. She's not there. Okay. Yeah. Well, so, like, so the motion's on the table then. She, it looks like she's coming into the meeting. Okay. Maybe. <laughs> I, I did add her, but... Sometimes you get lost in the black hole between the attendees and the panelists. Yeah. And, um, Leah, are you... Can you hear us, Leah? Oh, there she is. Yeah. Sorry, I had the spinning wheel of death for a little bit. I wasn't sure if I ended up in no man's land or if I was still on my way here. Uh, my name is Leah Mardrum. It's a pleasure for me to be here. I've been in the city as a resident for over 20 years. Um, I have kids in the district. I've uh, owned businesses in the city and managed some businesses in the city. And one of the things that I hold um, really dear to me is um, equity in the workplace and fair opportunities for employment. And the skills that I have that I would bring to the table, I'm, I have strengths in project management and a lot of connections in the community where I'm hoping that I can help raise in, like the um, awareness of the committee and what it can do for the city. Great. Any um, comments or questions from the committee? Leah, you highlighted a lot of the things that I had on, uh, on your resume, I appreciate, I appreciate the connection to the business community. I think that that's something that is really important to this particular board um, because employment is such a major factor in potential discrimination and educating business owners. Um, so I really look forward to having you serving on the board. Thanks, Amanda. <clears throat> How about full council? Any other comments or questions? Okay, well, thank you for your thank time you. and for thank being you. part of the Human Relations Board. Hopefully we can make some changes and, and get some of these complaints that we're getting um, taken care of. Have a good Be evening. <laughs> so I'd like to move this then to full council. If everybody approves, all in favor? Okay. Uh, second. <laughs> Okay, our next person on the list, um, Whitney. I'm sorry, did we, get, did we get a full approval there for the committee? Amanda seconded and... Yeah. Okay, I'm sorry, thank you. Got it, Brian. <laughs> Is Whitney... Um, Up to. Yeah. Is she? Mm Hello. Hi, Whitney. Hi, Whitney. Hi, guys. That was different. <laughs> <laughs> it is different. Uh, I was like on audio only. Um, I'm so glad to be here with you all today. Okay, so <laughs> let us know what you're going to do. <laughs> all right. So um, 
I actually uh, am a graduate of Millersville University. I got my degree in social work. Um, and so one of the things that I believe is that there are not enough social workers um, in politics. Thank you. And so I would actually uh, bring to the HRC board uh, is um, my background in child welfare and family services, um, trauma-informed care, knowing how to meet families and residents where they are um, and trying to help them uh, process through different issues or uh, discriminatory practices that they may have felt uh, they may have experienced. Um, I also uh, am looking forward to uh, continuing on with the town hall meetings uh, that the HRC board has been doing for the community um, and encouraging the community members to learn more about what the HRC does and how people can get involved and share any uh, disputes or issues that they have had. I'm gonna address Whitney first. I have a question, Whitney. Yes. Do you know which is the top complaints in the human relations? Um, I do not know. Uh, would you like me to take a guess? Go ahead. <laughs> um, <laughs> I am going to say uh, housing and employment. And in regards to housing and employment, which is the top group that file complaints? Uh, I wanna say... <laughs> I wanna say minority groups, but non-Hispanic. Well, there was the uh, Pennsylvania Human Relations Board says the complaint, the most complaints is disabled people. So the disability um, group or community, whichever you want to address it, is something that probably people don't pick up on. But those are things that we really need to, to work on. Um, and that's not only housing, but also, uh, like you said, um, there's employment. And there are other um, sectors that have really hurt them um, a lot. So thank you so much, uh, you know, for, for being part of it. And um, if anybody else have any comments or questions for Whitney. Whitney, I've appreciated that you've been really instrumental in helping to get uh, the work of the Human Relations Commission um, and the advocacy of the board uh, out to a wider audience. So I'm really looking forward to con that continuing. And Absolutely. I'll just add, oh, sorry. No, no. go ahead there. I, I'll just gonna... add, add Whitney that um, just uh, Councillor Diaz, I appreciate the, the data related to the state level uh, HRC and look forward to uh, having similar data for the city of Lancaster's HRC as well in the future. And so uh, Whitney, your guesses were mine too. Uh, and so I think that this is an opportunity for us uh, to continue to learn uh, as the work of the HRC accelerates uh, in 2021 with, with its new, um, new board members, including Ms. Lupton. Thank you, thank you. I'm really glad to be serving uh, our community here. Um, Lancaster really means a lot to me having gone to Millersville and, and raising my family here. So I'm really excited. For oh. me, the only quick thing I wanted to add, uh, just because it really resonates with me, Whitney, is that mentality of having more social worker in politics is exactly what brought me to where I am. And so to see other individuals have that same mentality um, is really exciting. One of the things that I talk about is like social workers used to do a lot of like lobbying and advocacy. Yeah. And we used to really make progressive changes, but then we all got into the weed works and are so busy just because our caseloads are so high that we've forgotten to find that balance. Uh, so I'm really excited that you're going to be joining on board. Um, and like Mayor said, with the Jeopardy questions, those were my guesses. So I look forward to how we we'll get the data for our end. Yes. Well, and then I'd like to, um, the motion is on the table. So, Second. And I'd like to move this then to next Tuesday meeting for full council, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you, Whitney. Thank you. Thank you, Whitney. And I'm not sure um, if you wanna check Amber and see if um, Ann Stretcher, 
is, is on is on the uh, Zoom. Oh, I didn't see Anne. Oh no, there she is. I didn't see her because she was already on her way in. Hello. <laughs> Hi. Um, my name is Anne. I work in education. I am the coordinator for community-based learning and community outreach in the Spanish department at Franklin and Marshall College. And um, I've been working in the community since I moved here about four years ago, particularly with the Latin American Alliance and doing a lot of volunteer work on their board. And I was looking for an opportunity to combine some of the experience I had and connections I had and serve the city in some way. And um, I'm really looking forward to the opportunity to work with other members of the board and get to know, know more people and, um, help out in any way that I can serve. Thank you so much. Um, do we have any questions then from the committee or any comments? Yeah, and I was uh, I was really excited to, to see that you're with FNM and I think that that's um, a really important um, organization and, and, and school in our community. And so um, it's great to have that representation on this board and that connection with campus be really, really important. Um, and thank you for, for wanting to do this. Anything from full council? Okay, the motion's on the table. Second. And uh, we can move this then to uh, next Tuesday if everyone is in agreement. Aye. Aye, thank you. Thank you, Anne, so much. Uh, next on the agenda is going to be reappointments then for the public art board. Um, and that would be John McGran and Ishma Waddell Smith. I'd like to make a motion then. Second. And I gather if Waddell like to speak or if... <laughs> hey y'all <laughs> <laughs> well then i guess we could move this to next tuesday uh, meeting uh for full council all in favor Aye. and at this point i think that's all i have for tonight um, and the uh do i have another one i'm sorry yeah. councillor diaz there um that was all that was on the agenda Unfortunately, I found uh, that there was a few others that I had neglected to put on the agenda. Okay. Um, there was Patty Connell for the Industrial Development Authority, a reappointment, and also um, Jamie Rines um, moving from the Human Relations Commission Board to the Human Relations Commission. Okay. And then there was a third one uh, with Rebecca Adels. Adelson? Addington. Addington, I'm sorry, to the um, to the Chris Authority. Um, are, th are they here or, let's see. Patty then, okay. Patty? Um, I did not ask um, Jamie okay. or uh, Patty Connell to join us. I believe that Rebecca Addington was being asked to join us. Okay, so then I guess I can, we can, um, I make a motion then for Patty to be appointed to the Industrial Redevelopment Authority. Yeah. Second. Any, anyone has any comments? With no comments, then we'll move this to full council if everyone's in favor for next Aye. Tuesday. Okay, and is Jamie here? Do we know or she's, she's not? No. I did not ask her to be here. Okay. Then I guess we'll, we'll make a motion then to um, um, put Jamie at the Human Relations Commission then for an appointment. Second. On the table. And um, if everyone's in favor, we'll move this to full council um, next Tuesday. Aye. Okay. Um, so then Rebecca, Rebecca's the one that is here from Chris. Yes. Good evening. Hi, Rebecca. Hi. Rebecca, if you'd like. I'm sorry. Um, could you please add Mr. Randy Patterson as well, who's joining uh, Amber? 
Thank you. Sorry about that. That's okay. Rebecca, if you'd like, you can address the um, council and um, give us a little bit of information about yourself and how excited you are. <laughs> Absolutely. So I was born in the Susquehanna Valley, but had kind of traveled all around um, with work and loved Lancaster and always hoped that I would come back here. And after getting experiences in a couple different worlds, such as publications and real estate and design, I actually came back, my husband and I moved back to the area a couple years ago and um, I founded and opened a business downtown called Villain Rue. Um, we're home furnishings and decor. And I just, I have a huge heart for not only Lancaster, but the business community, the community at large, um, and just finding ways to be a part of that, really. Great. Um, does the committee have any uh, comments or questions? I see uh, Randy Patterson has been added. I'd love to hear what Randy has to say. <laughs> okay. Um, full council? Unmuted. Oh, there he is. Hi. Hi. Um, Randy, so, long uh, time. <laughs> how is everybody? Uh, it's been a long time since I've been to a city council meeting. Um, so I just you. wanted to update you why Rebecca is being uh, nominated uh, to the CRIS. Uh, Nicole Vasquez uh, was actually appointed uh, about a year and a half ago uh, to fill the seat of Cynthia Kettering, who had to resign because she was moving out of the city at the time. And then Nicole, uh, unfortunately, had to offer her resignation uh, reluctantly, I will add, uh, because of family matters that she needs to take care of as well as her two businesses. So she's been uh, having difficulty uh, finding time for both meetings. She would love to come back uh, when her family matter is resolved. Um, she really enjoyed serving. Uh, we will have some other vacancies coming up at the end of 2021 uh, and in 2022. So this is really uh, to fill uh, Nicole's remaining two years. January of this year through December of 2022. And then obviously Rebecca would be uh, eligible for a five year, a full five year term at, at that point in time. And Rebecca is one of the mayoral appointments to the CRIS. The CRIS has nine voting members. Uh, six of those are nominated through the Senate, Senator Martin's office based on the way the CRIS language is written and the bylaws and three are from the mayor. Uh, so Rebecca is one of the mayoral nominations to the city council. Great. Thanks. So that motion's on the table. <laughs> Any other questions from anyone else? I have a question, Councillor Diaz, uh, while we have Randy with us. Um, Randy, I was just curious what the diversity of the CRIS board looks like at the moment. So Right now we have, uh, so John Reed is the chair, Christina Deal is the vice chair, Lisa Colon uh, is our treasurer, Mark Regenis, our secretary, Tom Baldridge, our assistant secretary, Marshall Snively, Faith Craig, um, and Shelby Nauman, and now Rebecca. Thank you. And because we actually don't have the opportunity to talk to you, um, with CRIS and moving forward, like what is the equity commitments from CRIS? Well, so the CRIS program is really a property-based program, mm -hmm. not a business-based program. What we're going through right now with the uh, grants for small businesses is an anomaly to the program is something that the state allowed us to do because of COVID. So it's really a property-based program as opposed to reaching out to businesses benefit once a property is redeveloped. Um, but we're always talking to small businesses. We actually created the small business loan fund so that those smaller businesses in the community could uh, <clears throat> apply for loans to expand. I will tell you that out of the 75 uh, applicants we have so far for the CRIS grants, 44 of those are either Hispanic owned, African American owned or women owned businesses. That's great. Thank you so much for that. I appreciate it. And Rebecca, I really look forward to working alongside you and I appreciate all the work that you're going to be doing. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. I look forward to it too. Okay, then I guess we'll move this to uh, next Tuesday. 
uh, to full council. All in favor? Aye. And I am going to say that that would be it. Is that correct? That is all for personnel, yes. Okay. <laughs> Okay, I'll move that to you, President uh, Wydell. <laughs> Thank you, Councillor Diaz. Um, and uh, to everybody who's been appointed to uh, board commission or authority or reappointed, um, Thank you uh, from me and uh, indeed from the rest of council, particularly um, to our uh, to our HRC um, nominees on the future of the Human Relations Commission and board uh, is really important. So I appreciate your role and the role, of course, of personnel chair, Councillor Diaz, um, in moving us uh, in that important direction. We move now to the Public Works Committee. Um, Councillor Soto, Amber, I see Mr. Campbell waiting to be added to the meeting. Councillor Soto, please. Thank you, Council President. At this time, I'd like to bring the Public Works Committee together. We have one item on the agenda this evening. That is uh, bill number four. Uh, Mr. Campbell, table is yours. Very good, thank you very much. Um, we're bringing this, uh, this resolu resolution to the table um, for a particular reason. Let me read it, the first part of it, and you'll have a, an inkling of what the challenge is for us. This is an ordinance of the council of the city of Lancaster prohibiting the use of personal delivery devices or PDDs on roadways, shoulders or berms of roadways or pedestrian areas under the jurisdiction of the city of Lancaster in accordance with Pennsylvania Act 106 of 2020 without the consent of the director of public works, establishing definitions providing for that prohibition to only become effective after a meeting of the authorized entity with representatives of the Department of Public Works and a finding by the department that use of the proposed device would constitute a hazard. So a, a law has just been put in place as of November 1st of 2020, a Senate bill um, 1199 at the state level uh, for personal delivery devices. It was enacted and I'm, I'm using this terminology because it is in the literature. It was enacted without Governor Worth Wolf's signature. It is now Act 106 of 2020 and went into effect this past Saturday, allowing PDDs, personal uh, delivery devices, to uh, be used basically where everyone wants to be able to use them uh, in, in any municipality. Um, with a couple of provisos. There are, there's the ability, a, a PDD for the sake of those who may not know what it is, it's a self, it's a device that can self pro propel itself. It's, it's kind of like a, ro a robot, a small robot. It looks like a, um, like a cooler on wheels uh, with a little bit of an, uh, an antenna on it. Um, <clears throat> and per the Pennsylvania Vehicle Code, PDDs are classified as pedestrians and are afforded the same rights as pedestrians. Um, it, it goes into effect to be used in a, in a couple of particular ways, up to 180 days. It has to be accompanied by a person uh, who, who, who monitors it, manages it. And after 180 days, it gets, it gets monitored by, it can be monitored remotely. Um, the authority that the municipality has is to either permit the use of PDDs on roadways or shoulders or berms or areas in the public right of way, or to prohibit the use of PDDs on such roadways, shoulders, et cetera, after consultation with the authorized entity. The authorized entity being the, the entity that owns or operates the PDD. Um, Barry can speak a little bit to the, to the reason why this legislation comes into effect, but, it, but basically it is that we have to assert our right to maintain the ability to review or deny the use of a PDD on the public roadways or the public right of way. Yeah, it, 
essentially what this is, is a, a state act that's approved the use of these electronic delivery devices for, I mean, presumably it's for companies like Amazon and everybody else that's delivering packages. Um, they get licensed at the state level. They don't want the, the municipalities are not allowed to do their own licensing or set any register, any regulations or anything like that. Um, they do allow a municipality to say, well, we don't want that one to be used, but you, you can't make a blanket assertion that we won't allow them. Um, you have to have a meeting with the particular entity to go over their particular device and how they want to use it particularly. And if we determine it to be a hazard, then we can deny it. Um, rather than trying to bring this to council with each single one of these every time by, I mean, the statute says resolution or ordinance, but because it's essentially a legislative act, I think it requires an ordinance. So for us to do that with each time one of these comes up seems a little bit uh, burdensome. So what we've done is drafted an ordinance that says, look, we know they're licensed by the state. And um, while we don't necessarily want them, we have to give everybody an opportunity to come in and convince us that they should be allowed to be used. And if they do convince us, then they get used. But if not, this ordinance is already authorizing. Unless they can convince us it's not a hazard, we're denying it that use. So the the burden is on them to prove to the Department of Public Works that their use will not be a hazard as defined in the act. And just for a clarification, that's the use in the public right of way, either on public berms, uh, roadways, et cetera, et cetera. So if someone wants to do it on a campus, on, a, on their private campus, that may not be a problem unless they're needing to cross a street or needing to use a sidewalk or something that is in the public right of way. Uh, Steve or Barry, what kind of items would these devices be transporting anyway? Couldn't tell you until the, until the applicant comes in, Counselor. <laughs> I mean, in all honesty, uh, I mean, there, these things can be up to 500 pounds under the state law. I mean, so the cooler, as Steve described, it can be a pretty darn big cooler. Um, okay. I, I suspect that the, the, the photos that are used in the state act in the literature that it's really supposed to be things that can go inside the cooler that somehow when the cooler shows up to your door, it opens up and you can reach in and grab your package. Um, but what any particular entity will use them for until they actually get licensed from the state and then apply to us um, to, to use it, I couldn't tell you. Okay. Any questions from the committee? If I may, Councillor Soso. Certainly, please. Yeah. Um, sorry, Barry. First of all, I'm glad to see you're a Ravens fan back there. But uh, <laughs> uh, I, I, <laughs> I, I think I got a little lost in the terminology. So sure. is the is this ordinance going to um, is it stopping any of these entities from offering these delivery devices or is it only stopping it or is it reverse? Is it um, if it becomes a hazard? Yeah, sorry, I just got it's, a little lost in that. It's time. really not either because of the very strange language of the state statute. What it's really doing is establishing the procedure pursuant to which the quote authorized entity, and I'll use Amazon because it's the easiest example. If Amazon gets a license from the state to operate uh, personal delivery devices and it says, oh, we want to do this in Lancaster, the ordinance now says, okay, well, here's how you do that in Lancaster. You will. Uh, follow the rules and regulations that the director of public works will promulgate to schedule a meeting with somebody at the department of public works to show them uh, you, the design, what your license is for, how it operates, uh, and to convince them that it will not be a hazard. If it is a hazard, they will say, no, you can't use it. If it is a, ha if it is not a hazard, then they will say, yes, you can. Got it. Okay. Thank presumptively, you. presumptively, I think the department of public works is looking at this very skeptically that with our narrow sidewalks, some of them brick, some of them not necessarily even condition, um, the way street lights are posed around our cities, um, the narrowness of some of our roads and alleys. Uh, I think Department of Public Works is looking at this as presumptively being um, a hazard, uh, but that doesn't mean if they chose certain streets within the city uh, and that's all they wanted to do it on that perhaps uh, it would not be. I mean, maybe if it was a commercial area where there isn't a lot of pedestrian traffic, you know, mm -hmm. I, we just can't presume, but we want to make sure we've set up the procedure uh, so that they're not deemed approved um, under the state law. Got it. That That's very helpful. Thank you. 
And I would just add that we appreciate that in this case, that local um, jurisdictions are not preempted uh, by a state legislative effort. And we are continuing to, to try to ensure that anything related to uh, wireless 5G deployment uh, would have to go through our own local process uh, before that gets deployed throughout the city. So this is this was hopeful to me uh, and to other mayors to see this legislation pass because it does include an opportunity for the local community to engage uh, with a vendor um, like, like uh, Barry had just gave as an example. Thank you, Mayor. Are there any other questions from city council? Are there any questions from the public, if there's anybody there that would like to address this item? Just a quick comment, Councillor Soto. Um, just, just thinking ahead of time, I had to do a quick Google search on what a personal delivery device is. <laughs> um, so maybe it's helpful when this goes to, if it goes to council um, to uh, possibly have some Im images for the public so they know what we're talking about, just a suggestion. Oh, that would be great. Mr. Campbell, Mr. Uh, Anwar, can you help us out with any images that you might come up with before Absolutely. we go? Absolutely. We can do a very, very uh, brief but uh, graphically interesting um, PowerPoint, maybe two or three slides that show what it looks like and how it gets operated. Well, that would be appreciated. That's good. Uh, good suggestion, Councilor Arroyo. Are there any other questions from the public? I was just gonna say, I know I'm noticing a lot of new names. So um, if you're in the audience and you'd like to comment, um, just click the raise hand button. Okay, hearing none, I'd like to entertain a motion to move this to full council on the 9th. So moved. Ms. Diaz, second please. Sorry, second. <laughs> I was muted. All in favor? Aye. Uh, Council President, that concludes the Public Works uh, Committee at this time. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Soto. All right, uh, moving right along. Uh, finance, Councilor Bakay. Thank you very much. Uh, this evening we have it, what looks to be three items on the agenda, but we will have a fourth. Um, so just a special note when we get there. Uh, the first is administration bill number five, 2021. I do see Mr. Hopkins and Barry, you're still on. I'm assuming that both of you will speak to us about this one. Correct. Okay, great. As soon as I don't begin talking with my mute button on. Um, so uh, we're going to, I'm gonna share my screen in a moment uh, to provide you uh, and uh, those in attendance, basically with the same roughly the same presentation that we made to city council during the uh, executive session last week. Uh, we've had to make some modifications just based on the fact that, you know, this is still ongoing uh, legal matter. Barry will start off uh, and we'll sort of tag team as we go through the presentation. Uh, and as you have questions or anything, just uh, let us know. And we will uh, make every attempt to answer. There may be some things that we can answer either off the top of our head or because there are Legal matters still involved, but we're, we'll do our best. Yeah. So let me uh, get my screen share on. Okay. All right, you should all be seeing the presentation now. Yes. Got it. Okay. So as a as a preface um, for the public, uh, City Council. Uh, you heard this a little bit when we were met in executive session. So to the public, we met in executive session because as is well known, uh, many of the issues related to the fiber optic network installed in the city of Lancaster um, pursuant to an agreement that was entered into um, seven year, almost seven years ago now um, has been in litigation for a period of time. Uh, and we are hoping that that litigation is going to come to a resolution through a settlement agreement. And that's, the basis for tonight's presentation is in order to do so, um, we will need city council to take action. So we've entitled um, this, the unwinding of the mall agreement. 
And in order to give everybody a little bit of background, um, how did this project get started? Um, it was started by the execution of what was known as a municipal carrier agreement, for lack of better words, an agreement. Uh, in December of 2014, uh, pursuant to which Mall Communications was going to install new high quality fiber optic cable throughout the core of the city, primarily on poles owned by Pennsylvania Power and Light, uh, but also um, some on other types of poles and a, and a portion of it in uh, the core center district of the city underground. Um, Mall did do that work. It kept the previously installed fiber on the same poles uh, in most of the cases in different locations so that the old fiber could continue to operate the existing uh, safety cameras and traffic signals uh, that were utilizing that cable until those facilities were actually transferred to the new fiber. Um, Ma also established Land City Connect um, and began making connections which are referred to in this industry as service drops to Lancaster customers from the new fiber it installed. So uh, during the, the, what at the time was called phase one of the fiber uh, backbone installation. And when we say backbone, we mean the sort of, if you think of like water pipes, uh, like the main distribution uh, system. So like a water main under the street, that's what the backbone is. And, and as Barry referenced, uh, the majority of that backbone was installed overhead on uh, PPNL and Verizon and other uh, owned company owned poles. Uh, the core of the downtown, because there's a prohibition on overhead wires, was done uh, through uh, technology called micro trenching, so done in the street. Um, so that phase one of the fiber backbone is what you see in pink on this map here. Um, you know, you can tell that the the majority of it really was uh, in the the core of the downtown, uh, a fair amount in the southeast, in the northeast. Uh, and lesser amounts in the Northwest and the, the least amount in the Southwest. And that was really just a matter of uh, how the phasing of the project was originally, uh, originally thought, to, thought to go. And the total of the fiber backbone that's uh, been installed, this is a, there are a bunch of terms of art in this uh, presentation. This one is uh, sheath miles. So what that is, is just a mile of fiber regardless of the number of actual individual uh, glass fibers that are within that. So just think of it as a, you know, a multiple wire, multiple fibers inside of one sheath. That's the sheath mile. So uh, 16 miles of fiber installed throughout the city between 2015 and 2017. And then the, uh, the green parts that you see there are what was originally envisioned uh, as additional expansion be, uh, after phase one of the backbone. So this isn't necessarily where we think additional fiber is going to go now, but this is what was originally thought of back uh, in, this map was created in 2017. So, uh, and it includes, uh, I'm not sure of the exact number of miles, uh, but it's another, you know, segment of miles uh, to be installed in the main four square uh, you know, block of the city and some uh, running out. Uh, this is Harrisburg Pike and this is New Holland Pike. So um, this is looking at, uh, wanna talk about sort of the original investment or the, the investment actually to date uh, that's been made in the, in the fiber. And uh, for counselors, I just wanna point out that the, the number on the total investment that we have included here and on a slide later is uh, a little bit higher than what we showed. And the reason for that is that I went back and also looked at all of our professional services expenses, which was uh, legal expenses all the way from 2014 through 2020. Um, expenses that we had for Celerity, which is a, uh, a private sector firm that we brought in uh, in early 2018 uh, after the issues with Maul and PPL came into play. Um, and a few other uh, expenses related to the arbitration. So we wanted to really give you the, what the all-in number is, including fiber and the professional services. So the, uh, that investment totals about $3 million, which includes the fiber backbone itself, remote switching stations. And there's a picture of one of these, one of the two remote switching stations here. Uh, this one is uh, on uh, land within Stork Park at the corner of Mulberry and James Street. There's another, basically the identical building uh, and related 
uh, equipment inside, electrical service. There's a uh, uh, gas-fired uh, backup electrical generator. There's one of these also at Farnham Par at Carlton Park. Sorry, uh, um, old school. I'm going to call it Carlton Park for a long time, or uh, Farnham Park for a long time. And that one is uh, located right along Water Street, uh, basically across the street from Water Street Mission. So fiber backbone, remote switching stations, uh, Land City Connect, uh, and which is a subsidy that was uh, provided through, uh, through by the city, basically to cover the upfront cost of individual installations of Land City Connect at residential properties. And then the, the uh, related legal service or professional services that I talked about. So all of that adds up to just over $3 million. And then uh, the other piece of this was a $1.5 million operating capital loan that went to Maul. And that was basically to be the operating capital for Maul to uh, build out the Land City Connect system throughout the city. So I'll talk a little bit later on in the presentation about the sort of the details of those numbers um, and what revenues we've gotten back to date. Uh, but those are the ballpark numbers that you want to think about is $3 million for the installation of the fiber backbone and related expenses, and then $1.5 million uh, loan to mall. So um, one of the things that we're, uh, and I'll talk about this on a later slide too, because there is both the cost and then there's the value. Um, and oftentimes we think of those two things as being the same thing. But in this case, the, we want to differentiate the cost of the fiber that's been installed and, and the other, you know, the professional service fees and others that, that we've incurred. And what we believe is the value of the fiber. Um, and the value of the fiber really is, uh, we believe, significantly more than the cost that we've incurred for the fiber. And the reason for it is that, uh, and this is from a, uh, what you see on the slide now is a uh, from a white paper done by uh, an organization called CTC that we've had some communication with over the last several months. Um, and this was a white paper that they did on public infrastructure, uh, private service, and it's a, their, their shared risk model for 21st century broadband infrastructure. Um, and what they have, what they look at in this report is really that the public-private uh, partnership is the right model for broadband, uh, fiber optic broadband. And the reason for that is that um, the upfront cost is very expensive uh, to installing fiber, as you've seen from the numbers I just talked about. And at the same time, so the, the, with that upfront expense, uh, typically the private sector is gonna want a much faster return on that investment than uh, they can get through fiber uh, broadband installation. So municipalities come into play or public uh, sector uh, entities come into play. It could be individual municipalities or, or county governments or even states in some cases uh, to make that upfront investment. And the value is derived over a very long period of time because install once fiber is installed, there it, it, it doesn't carry electrical power. All it does is carries light. Um, if it is installed properly, it can last decades. Um, and the, the bandwidth of it is expandable, not by doing anything different to the fiber, but simply by having new and better technology on both ends of the fiber. Um, the graphical part here on the right is looking at the uh, speed capability of different types of technology. Um, yeah, what's, what's installed obviously throughout Lancaster City and, and many others is uh, cable, uh, coax cable that uh, like Comcast or, or any other cable provider uses. And that has a, uh, you know, speeds of up to one gig. The fiber right now, um, actually Land City Connect runs on, uh, and the city's internet connection uh, has up to one gig speeds. Over time, those speeds are anticipated to go at to 10 gigabit or even above that based on the new, te new technology coming into play over a period of years. Um, 5G, which is often talked about, Mayor referenced it in terms of uh, legislative effort at the state to encourage uh, 5G networks to be installed. Right now, it uh, has a, uh, about 50 megabit uh, connection speed and potentially up to one megabit, or I'm sorry, one gigabit. 
but really sort of caps out at that. Uh, and the fact is that wireless technology requires a whole lot of fiber. Uh, wire. Uh, fiber is a, is a way to transport a lot of that data that uh, ultimately gets sort of the last mile or last hundred several feet uh, connection to properties uh, really depends on fiber as a, as a backbone. So um, it's impossible to say something is completely future-proof, but uh, fiber optic cable sort of fits into that category, at least if you think of future as being the next 20, 30, 40 years. Um, and so we can, in this presentation, we're, gonna, we're talking about the cost of the installed fiber. Um, the value of that installed fiber, we think, is in the private sector part of the partnership that we foresee coming in the future. Um, we can't put a number to that right now, um, but we think that it far outstrips the, the cost that we've put into the system. So back to Barry. So we built this thing, or Maul built this thing, started operating, and then what happened? Uh, as many of you may be aware from some of the newspaper reporting, uh, in late 2017, PPL sued Maul uh, in the Court of Common Pleas of Lehigh County, which is where uh, PPL is located, which is why that location was chosen. Uh, Lehigh County, the court uh, there ordered Maul to suspend further work and authorize PPL to begin taking down unauthorized attachments. What they were really directing them or authorizing the takedown were some of those service drops that I mentioned earlier. Um, and it was the service drops that, that PPL felt violated PPL policy. Um, as Ma brought actions against PPL, um, as this proceeded, Ma fought back by filing separate actions against PPL, both before the uh, Pennsylvania Public Utility Commission and the FCC. And so Ma and PPL were fighting in three different forums uh, and we were monitoring uh, all of them and we became a party in the Lehigh County proceedings in order to make sure that PPL would not be allowed to take down anything uh, that affected city services like traffic signals. Um, and through the course of those three, three pieces of litigation, we became aware that Maul may have violated its obligations under that municipal carrier agreement and namely violated the, the covenant and requirement to have obtained all approvals required before doing the necessary work from PPL. Um, during this time, Maul also ceased making its payments to the city under and pursuant to the loan documents for the $1,500,000 loan that Patrick mentioned. Um, at the time they stopped paying them, they'd, they'd paid the city approximately $180,000 in principal and interest payments. Um, the agreement between the city and Maul requires that disputes be handled through the American Arbitration Association rather than in a court proceeding. Um, once so prior to actually prior to Maul and PPL settling, uh, Maul did initiate claims in arbitration against the city, um, alleging that we, the city, owed it money for um, all the work it was doing in fighting PPL, amongst other things, um, and for other engineering costs that it believed it had. Um, the city countersued or claimed in those arbitration proceedings against Maul that it had violated the agreement and uh, breached the agreement and that it had violated the loan documents. Uh, in June of this past year, Maul and PPL settled their disputes in the Lehigh County action. This allowed uh, for the city to begin discussing resolving its disputes with Maul um, and allowed us to leverage a little bit some of the protections we built into the original agreements to get to a point where we might be able to settle this. Um, originally, we were scheduled for arbitration in June of 2020. It was rescheduled to November and then again until December. Uh, and I'm pleased to report that it's, it's generally off now as we've reached a potential settlement, um, which was evidenced by a letter of intent that was signed. Um, and we'll get to that in a few moments. Um, through those, uh, the processes of the litigation um, the use of some outside sources to help us understand some of the issues in those proceedings, we've learned a few things. Um, we had the right concept, as Patrick indicated earlier. A private-public partnership is definitely uh, the way to go. Uh, Patrick and I will talk a little bit. There's a very limited number of cities in the U.S. that have done this. Um, it's, you know, under 100, and the majority of them are doing it in some form of public-private partnership. 
Um, we had the right concept. What we didn't have was the right partner. Um, and the right partner, obviously, in any sort of partnership is everything. Um, you know, you don't have a good marriage without two good partners working to help each other. Um, so the installed, what we've also learned, the installed fiber, it's very high quality, far more bandwidth and functionality than we ever even understood when this started back in 2013 and 2014. There are in some cases, 96 to 112 strands being carried in that, in those 16 sheath miles that Patrick referenced, which gives an amount of power and usage that quite frankly, we're not even touching with what we're already doing using the cable. Um, the city's investment in the fiber in, in, infrastructure to date, um, as Patrick has indicated, has significant value. The costs paid were reasonable. So we, we have asked Celerity, who's been in this business for many years, and some others to just kind of look at, look for us at, you know, did you spend too much? Did you spend enough? Um, and quite frankly, what we've spent for the installed cable is reasonable. It's within the realm of, of the norm um, for putting the cable up. Um, what's extraordinary is the value um, and putting a number on that is a challenge, uh, but it's more about your imagination. There's a very high level of engineering and other technical knowledge, which is required to maximize the bandwidth available and in installed fiber. Um, we'll need to tap into that sort of technology and experience as we move forward. So why settle with Maul? We keep talking about the value. The best analogy I've heard for uh, this fiber, um, the first time I heard the word used was by Steve Campbell, who was with us a little earlier tonight and saying, this is infrastructure. And it is. If you think about some of the things that have happened in the country and the world, um, railroad expansion in the 19th century opened up the West Coast to the East Coast and the East Coast to the West Coast. And then in the 20th century, we built a state, we built a state interstate highway system. Fiber optic cable is essentially the next type of infrastructure that does the same thing. Think about what we've been doing at home since March 13th or so of 2020. We've been communicating the way we have right here in Zoom meetings, uh, electronically over internet systems that rely on the transfer of signals that can go through cable like the fiber optic cable. And the one thing everybody is saying, Republican, Democrat, uh, somebody that believes in COVID or doesn't believe in COVID, you take everybody that's been uh, up in arms over the last nine months regarding what's gone on with having to be at home, is the technology to communicate remotely is the next great thing. Businesses are talking about how they're not going to send as many people back to the physical places they were working before, how this is changing. Mean, we talked about personal delivery devices tonight. Those devices will require a wire. It's not just a remote control. It's not like a radio frequency. Um, they're all done on computer signals. So, um, you know, Patrick's put together a really nice three chart uh, graphic here that shows a couple of different types of uses that this fiber gets to. The first chart in dark blue are the current uses. So we're already utilizing the newly hung fiber optic cable for our remote water meter reading, for um, our intranet system among city, city facilities and city buildings, and for some of our traffic signals, not all of them. Um, those were original goals of it before we even started thinking about Land City Connect, and Land City Connect was added as the process developed. Um, you know, in the far green are the private sector uses that we can already imagine competitive video streaming services, additional telecommunication services. I can tell you we've already been contacted by several uh, companies in each of those who might have an interest in using the fiber optic cable we've already installed. And then other private sector uses, what we call dark fiber. Um, which is, you know, as Patrick pointed out, 5G needs a wire. It has to have somewhere to tip off the point of, point of start for that signal. So in between all that is something that 
you know, the administration has been talking about, which is what are the community benefits? And the biggest of those is creating digital equity. And that's the whole reason for Land City Connect was to start to have a, a low cost, high speed internet service available to city residents and businesses. Um, obviously streaming education services, um, the, uh, the Lancaster Safety Coalition uh, camera network, those are all uses. And there are going to be uses that we haven't even begun to think about that are going to arise. Uh, I mean, we didn't think about 5G seven years ago. You know, I, I started practicing law and the, the great big thing was a fax machine. And, and that, I'm not that old. You know, a cell phone started after I started practicing law. And again, I'm not that old. Um, so why settle with mall? Because we need to have control of that fiber and, and be able to start visioning and planning for it now and not letting time go by unwasted. So uh, Barry talked about in uh, the, the relatively small number of, of communities across the U.S. that have uh, been able to successfully install um, citywide fiber systems. And, and the, the terminology for citywide is, is if 80% of the uh, residents and, and businesses in the community can be actually reached by that fiber. So you can't, you know, put in a couple miles in a in a 60,000 person community and be deemed, uh, you know, providing citywide fiber. So uh, this is a map that uh, was updated through 2019 uh, by an organization called Community Networks, which really focuses on uh, broadband systems throughout the country. And there, there are only 63 communities that have been able to pull this off. And part of it is the up, that upfront cost that I talked about. Uh, part of it is, uh, the right partner or partners being in place. Uh, and some of these are very rural communities where they're, uh, you know, the access to uh, the, the uh, type of, of, you know, both financial, but also sort of engineering and, and technical know-how might not exist uh, in, in some of these communities. And then the third is uh, the red states there. That's not a blue and red issue. That is a matter of states where there is legislation that presents some sort of a hurdle to uh, community broadband systems, uh, publicly owned community broadband systems. And Pennsylvania is one of those states. Uh, Pennsylvania requires that a municipality that wishes to provide uh, municipal provided broadband service to first get the permission of what's called the incumbent local carrier in our case, it's Verizon. So they're the incumbent uh, phone provider. That that phone provider has to give permission to the municipality. Basically, they have a right of first refusal. Um, we got that permission from Verizon back in 2014, uh, before we entered into the <laughs> municipal carrier agreement. Uh, and so, you know, we've we've passed that one hurdle. There, uh, if you look at this map closely on Pennsylvania, there's one community in Pennsylvania that actually has uh, municipal uh, provided broadband and it's uh, the borough of Kutztown and they've actually had a fiber system in place for well over a decade. Um, and on that, they there's a uh, streaming entertainment provider, there's internet service and some other services that they provide there. Uh, they're the only one in Pennsylvania that's been able to pull this off and you know they're one of 63 across the country. So. Um, we look to be added to this map in the not too distant future. So now uh, what everybody probably wants to hear is what are the terms of the settlement with Mall? And again, this is a proposed settlement um, and we can't get into more detail than what we're gonna give you here tonight, because again, it is in litigation, um, council action will be required to get us there. But the, the, the general terms of the settlement are that Mall will transfer all of its fiber optic network network assets in Lancaster. Now, it has other business in other municipalities, but here in Lancaster, uh, it's gonna transfer all of the fiber optic cable, um, the backbone that we've talked about, the two remote switching stations and all of the other um, equipment, engineering system documentation uh, that goes with it. Um, it's not only going to transfer them to us in an as-is condition, we're going to own 100% of them, we being the city. Uh, with that, the city will own 100% of Land City Connect. 
the terminate the 2014 municipal carrier agreement will be terminated um, and mall will release any legal or financial claims it may have against the city um, so we get ownership we get control we get use that we didn't otherwise have uh, and we are going to have to give something to mall so in exchange um, we're going to forgive the 1.5 million the balance owed on the 1.5 million dollar promissory note and we're gonna pay the sum of $1.2 million. As a result, the arbitration will be terminated. The city will have no ongoing relationship with Mall. One exception is that following settlement, we may engage them for no more than three months, but hopefully even shorter to manage Land City Connect while we do what's needed to get somebody else to run it, whether that be us or another entity. Uh, the city, as I indicated, will own and control the fiber infrastructure its future uses, revenues, and expenses. Um, the city will have the ability to utilize the full power and capacity of the fiber and to control that infrastructure. And we'll have the ability to continue Land City Connect, to modify it, expand it, recreate it. What's key to note is that we didn't have all those things under the existing municipal carrier agreement. Land City Connect was gonna be Land City Connect and we were going to receive uh, a revenue share from that 13%, which was gonna cover our costs. Ownership and control was vested with Mall. We would have the right to use a portion of the strands for our city purposes, such as the traffic uh, signals, um, such as our intranet system, our water meter reading for safety, safety cameras, but we didn't own it and we couldn't control future uses. Mall controlled those. Um, we are actually getting far more than what we were paying for. That, that ability to control all of those potential uses gives us the endless ability to control not only what's done in our city and how it's used, but the revenues that would come from it. Sorry, I jumped the gun on the slide changing. Um, so uh, this slide is actually from the uh, financing presentation that I did uh, back in 2017 when we were getting ready to roll out uh, Land City Connect. And I wanted to uh, put it back in front of you because the two things that I have uh, circled in red are the two things basically that we are uh, proposing to have you amend to authorize uh, us to be able to uh, get through the settlement agreement with Maul uh, under the terms that Barry just described there. So the first thing that was done was there was a city council ordinance that was a supplemental appropriation for an interfund loan from the general fund to a new uh, special revenue fund, and that's a, the accounting term for it, uh, for Land City Connect. So that was a $1.5 million interfund loan from the general funds to the Land City Connect fund. The second uh, supplemental appropriation, I'm sorry, the funds from that $1.5 million from the general fund were used for the uh, uh, operating capital loan to mall. So that's that 1.5 million. The second 1.5 million uh, supplemental appropriation was an interfund loan from the water fund to uh, the land city connect fund. And those funds are what we were using for the subsidy that I mentioned earlier to uh, make the connections to individual residents uh, throughout the city. And that upfront cost uh, was roughly $1,000 per property to get a service drop to the property and for the, uh, the router and some of the other equipment that was installed at a property. And the reason for that was we, uh, that upfront cost has to be covered somehow. Uh, putting it on the customer upfront is going to severely limit the number of customers and would basically get rid of any opportunity for getting rid of the digital divide. Uh, so we were subsidizing that upfront and then getting a repayment of uh, that $1.5 million over time through the franchise fee, the additional 13% that was added on a customer bill. So ultimately a customer was paying it, but they were paying it uh, over a period of years. So those were the two uh, sets of funding that went into the Land City Connect Fund. Uh, when we break those down uh, into uh, the sort of separate buckets, so this $1.5 million here, that was the principal uh, that we loaned to Mall. 
Uh, as Barry mentioned earlier, uh, they had paid some of that back. They had made principal and interest payments uh, of about $180,000. The next three lines here that I have uh, colored in yellow are basically the investment that I talked about earlier. Um, so about $2.2 million in fiber uh, and related uh, professional services. And I'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, the Land City Connect subsidies of uh, about $390,000. And then the professional services that I mentioned earlier of legal and uh, celerity fees, uh, actually arbitrator fees are included in here as well. So about $420,000. So all in, including the mall uh, principal loan, about $4.5 million. I, I put this arrow on here uh, because the actual installation of purchase and installation of fiber uh, amounted to just over $2 million uh, out of that amount paid to mall for the fiber project. The other parts were some uh, engineering for the uh, city uh, computer network among uh, the city hall, treasury office, police station, and the uh, county IT center at, at 150 North Queen. Uh, and then also some engineering for the traffic system interconnection. So the actual fiber costs were just about $2 million. Um, Barry had put the question to uh, Celerity about whether or not, you know, was that basically a fair cost for what we, for the, for the fiber that was purchased, the quality of the fiber, and then the installation of that fiber. And essentially uh, what we got back was a breakdown of um, two different costs for fiber uh, in terms of sheath miles uh, and the building of the remote switching stations and the purchase of the gear in those two remote switching stations. The estimate that we got back, and so this was sort of blind to the costs that we incurred. The estimate that we got back from Celerity was right around $1.9 million. So within $100,000 of the actual cost that we have. So that's why when Barry talked about, you know, did the, did the, cost, of, did the cost that we put into this system, uh, was it fair? Um, and so based on those numbers that we got from Celerity, we think that it was. Um, so that, that's the cost side of this equation. And then on the revenue side, as I mentioned earlier, we had gotten about one point, or I'm sorry, about $180,000 in principal and interest repayments from mall uh, between the time that they began paying back and when they stopped paying uh, in 2019. We got about $20,000 of franchise fee payments. And uh, we got, uh, we had interest earnings on money that was sitting in that Land City Connect fund of about $23,000. So in all, we've gotten through the end of 2020 about $223,000 back. So our net uh, investment was just under $4.3 million. So the council action that uh, we're asking you for is basically to handle the funds that we have remaining in the Land City Connect fund and authorize uh, additional uses for those funds. And in, the, in total, that what sits in the Land City Connect Fund as of 1231-20 is about $1,331,000. That is there because of about $1.1 million remaining from the Water Fund $1.5 million interfund loan that wasn't spent on uh, Land City Connect subsidies. And then this $223,000 of repayments franchise fee payments and interest earnings. So in total, it's about $1.3 million. And so that gets to the, the council action. Um, in the two ordinances that I talked about earlier, the uh, Land City Connect uh, funding ordinances, there was specific language in there about how those funds could be used. And so the ordinance that is in front of you now is basically adding additional language to uh, to that authorization. Uh, and it's, it's this language, whoops, I'm sorry. I just skipped out and give me just a second. Um, so it's this language that starts with notwithstanding uh, the foregoing commencing February 24, 2021, which would be after uh, if city council moves this forward and, and adopts this ordinance, that's the date that it would be adopted, uh, actually February 23rd. Uh, these funds may be used for the following additional purposes. To settle any and all disputes with mall communications, 
pay costs associated with the operation of Land City Connect, including internet service fees, pay fees and costs from consultants and others utilized in determining best uses of the city's fiber optic cable, and for other similar uses associated with the unwinding of the city's municipal carrier agreement with mall communications. And that really, I mean, there's other language in the ordinance, but that's the key language there that, that provides additional authorization uh, to the administration to uh, continue this unwinding, get the settlement agreement actually accomplished and uh, then begin planning for that envisioned future. And with that, uh, we have given you an awful lot of information and uh, we wanna give you an opportunity now to ask questions that you may have. So I'm gonna stop the share, but I can go back to it if we uh, get to a point where you would like to see any of the individual slides. Perfect. Thank you very much, both of you. Um, I do have two questions to start before I open it up to the committee and then the council as a whole. Um, I wanted to go back to, I have all my notes in front of me. Um, so something that you had mentioned about the value of the fiber as it is right now, um, and that it could last decades if installed properly. Um, that's sort of, you know, we're looking forward, we're hoping to get a lot out of obviously, what we have. And I know that you mentioned that Solarity looked at the fiber that was installed for the quality. Have we also looked and inspected the quality or um, the, uh, the way it was installed and yep. is it deemed installed properly? Yes. Um, I mean, I'll, ans I'll answer that as yes, Solarity was uh, pleased with the installation. Um, we're buying it as is. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know that Solarity has inspected every single pole. Um, they've been up on a lot of them, um, but we're satisfied. They're satisfied that um, for that part of the project, uh, there is not a lot of dispute that, that the, the fiber was hung was high quality and it was hung in a um, manner that's appropriate, um, properly attached, et cetera. Um, as, with, as with anything that's on a pole, um, there will be times where that's gonna need to be uh, changed, cleaned up, or or moved, and there will be some wire work that needs to be done, particularly with respect to the wire, the existing cable that's still on the poles, um, and whether that is removed or uh, reattached in a different way, that will need to be ulti ultimately will need to be done as well. Great. Um, also, uh, this was a question I had during our previous meeting, and I think it would be it would be good to mention it here. Um, obviously, one of the, the new uses for these funds is to enter into this settlement. And one of the previous uses of the funds were to subsidize these service drops for our residents connecting the Land City Connect. Um, if in the future we have the right partner uh, for this type of, of service to our residents, um, we obviously, you mentioned the digital divide, $1,000 for residents is very expensive. Would in a new potential partnership, could there be a way for th uh, those costs to be absorbed a different way? Yes. Okay, so that those funds, obviously we're using them, they're not gonna be there in the future. So, you know, as part of this, we said, what have we learned? Mm -hmm. You know, we've learned a lot, um, quite frankly. So we know what we need to look for in structuring whatever we do going forward with whomever we do it with. Um, and the way we did it in the past does not necessarily mean that's the way we have to do it in the future. By owning the cable and having complete control, we'll be in, the, we'll be in position to choose how we want to do it and whom we want to do it with, and then how the cost will be shared will obviously become part of that. Um, so, you know, we will not be obviously jumping into, um, you know, another partnership tomorrow with the first company that comes and says, we want to do this. No, council, uh, can rest assured that there will be a very thorough um, process, several processes, quite frankly, that are done before anything happens. One is just a complete visioning and planning, a, for lack of a better word, a capital plan for the fiber. Uh, and then second, once that plan is in place uh, and a determination has been made as to the best way to move forward with proposals for you know, finishing Land City Connect, re-establishing it, rebranding it, expanding it, whatever that is, uh, then we will be looking for partners in that. And that will be vetted uh, extremely carefully. And, um, you know, suffice it to say, council will get to be involved in that process as well. 
Yeah, and, for, and from a, a financing standpoint, I mean, obviously our goal would be not invest another single dollar into the entire system, uh, be able to provide fantastic high-speed, low-cost internet service for our residents and you know, each, you know, meet each of those other uh, community needs that were on that one slide. Uh, we're not gonna be able to do this with not a single additional dollar of city funds invested, but part of uh, what we view as the right partner or partners are also those that come to the table with their own financing capabilities. Uh, so that we can have some additional shared, uh, you know, shared risk and shared reward and shared funding of uh, the build out of the system. And in, and in all honesty, counselors, the investment we've made to date is the heavy end capital investment that normally is the hard part to deal with in any of these ventures. The fact that we've already spent it and have the backbone up doesn't mean we won't have to spend anything, but puts us in a very, very different position um, from a leverage standpoint and negotiating standpoint um, and partnering standpoint with anybody else. Um, far different than where we were when we started this, where there's a whole lot of risk to be shared. Right now, we've already incurred the risk, so it's going to be a whole lot easier for us to control what's done in the future. And I just want to make clear, Councillor Bake and to the public, that there have not, there's not even a thought about who the partner or partners could be in this effort moving forward uh, because it was um, the settlement agreement and the most important thing is to have control of the entire infrastructure so that we can move forward with the process that Barry outlined and a series of RFPs to begin to identify partners for different aspects of the utilization of this uh, both from, you know, from uh, a community benefit perspective related specifically to the digital divide and closing that because that the impetus for this project was really driven by that and recognizing that in a lot of markets, uh, larger companies uh, can't make the kind of profit uh, in, in uh, establishing broadband. Uh, and especially in um, poorer neighborhoods. And so that, that continues to be a high priority. And there are also these other opportunities for us to explore, uh, recognizing that some maybe are going to be a better fit than others, but uh, the fact that we will own it gives us the opportunity to begin that exploration. And we've, we've begun the process of not looking for companies that will provide services, but researching and vetting experts who can help guide us in the process of visioning and finding experts and finding companies and finding the right partners and structuring those deals. Um, we, haven't, we haven't selected one, but we have been, we have worked on that. Um, we can't obviously, as the mayor said, we can't, we can't put out RFPs, we can't do anything definitively because we have a tentative settlement agreement. Um, and until we know it actually settles and have control, we can't do any of these things. And so there is part of this, it's like, which came first, the, you know, the, the horse or the cart. Um, unfortunately, in this case, we have to have council take the leap of faith and say, we need to take this action. We need to settle and get control. And then we can do all the hard work of visioning, um, partnering and everything else that needs to be done to treat that valuable piece of infrastructure uh, with the deference and um, importance it deserves. Thank you. Um, if, are there any questions from the committee? Or other members of council at this time? You've given us lots of information. Um, I will open it up if there are members of the public that have questions. And I know that uh, just reiterating that there may be, we may be limited on the answers right now um, because of the nature of the settlement, but if anyone does have questions. Amber, it looks like there is one. Hey everybody, just one quick question yeah. and good to see you all. Um, if everything goes well, do you kind of have a new projected timeline on the rollout and what things would look like moving forward? Thank you. 
No, <laughs> we don't. Two, yeah, I know, two. and and the answer is easy uh, because we we don't yet. Uh, we're we would like to continue to maintain Land City Connect in some form or fashion, uh, whether that's a you know whole new rebrand, whatever. We we would like to maintain and expand that, but we don't have a timeline for this. This is all predicated on obviously council's assent to. Uh, the settlement agreement and this continuing through the settlement process, which uh, will take us through uh, pretty much the end of February. Uh, when we do have that timeline uh, and sense of next steps, obviously we'll be able to share that publicly. Uh, but no, uh, at, at this point, we, we've been really careful about not getting ahead of ourselves simply because we, we have to own it first uh, before we and move anything further. Great. Well, I really appreciate that. Uh, we've been looking forward to this for a long time, and <laughs> I've been looking forward to this conversation and learning about where things were. So thank you very much. Thank you, Noah. Thank, thank you. Noah. I think we all agree. We've been looking forward to this for a long, long time. Mm -hmm. Three years, in fact. <laughs> Longer. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so um, not seeing any other questions at this time, I will entertain a motion to move this ordinance for first reading uh, to the next council meeting, which is going to be Tuesday the 9th. Do I hear a motion? So moved. Second. Thank you. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. That concludes my first item <laughs> on the agenda. <laughs> uh, the second item for the Finance Committee this evening is resolution number seven of 2021, modifying the capital improvement plan. And that has to do with the 2018 bond issue as I'm looking at it, it's coming up. Uh, will that be you, Mr. Hopkins? It is, uh, it'll be me with uh, potentially some chiming in by Mr. Campbell. So uh, I'm gonna share my screen again, uh, a significantly smaller uh, information to provide to you uh, than, than the last one. Um, so this is, uh, you've seen these come before uh, council before, uh, we have, when we did the 2018 bond issue or any of the ones prior to that, uh, city council approves an initial list of projects and then also approves the uh, maximum amount of bond funds that can be allocated to any individual project. As we go through the years uh, as projects, especially in the public works world, uh, go from a sort of a conceptual or a planning stage through engineering and then actually into uh, construction bidding and awarding of, uh, awarding of contracts to vendors, uh, we get a much better you know, set of numbers in front of us. So what, what we tried to do here was take all of the changes that we saw would be needed uh, primarily on the water side, but there's uh, one change here on the sewer, or I'm sorry, primarily on the sewer side, but there's one change here uh, also on the water side. Um, some of this is a uh, result of getting better numbers for individual projects. Uh, some of it's also though a result of the additional financing that we got uh, through the PenVest loan. Um, again, mostly on sewer, but also uh, there were some opportunities on the water side as well. So what I've, uh, there's three pages to this uh, list of projects and uh, I wanna sort of group them together uh, in projects where we are deleting a project somewhere where we're making a, an amended project budget and then where we're adding new, uh, new projects. So the first uh, project here is one that uh, we were able to fund through the PenVest uh, loan that city council approved in 2020. So that was originally uh, set at a million eight fifty. We haven't spent any of the dollars on that, not for any engineering design, anything like that. So in that case, we're simply eliminating that project altogether. So deleting it from the, the authorized list. Then we have, uh, sorry, we have another set of projects uh, and it's really, it's projects three, four, five, eight, and 11. And those are the project numbers assigned when we first passed uh, this uh, project list in 2018. For these projects, uh, most of them were 
alternatively funded through the PenVest loan. In the case of the first project though, uh, this was one that we, uh, we did the project using prior uh, sewer fund capital improvement uh, funds from the 2014 bond issue. And we did the project at the same time as we were building the Public Works Operations Center because this Groftown Road pump station uh, generator, uh, the pump station is located really right behind the new operations center in Lancaster Township. So those projects were combined. Uh, we spent a very tiny little bit of dollars uh, on that and we're just eliminating the rest of the funding. So in effect, deleting the project, but because we had funds spent on it, um, we're, we can't completely delete the project. Then we have uh, Maple Grove pump station expansion, the Maple Grove interceptor upgrade, uh, the Eden Manor Groftown uh, interceptor replacement project. Those were all funds, uh, all projects funded by the PenVest loan. Um, and then the last one where we're making a uh, significant uh, reduction in the budget, basically eliminating the additional funding was this electrical service upgrade project. And it was combined with another project, uh, number 16. And uh, we've already funded the escrow required for the city's portion of the project. So we can eliminate the rest of those funds. Then uh, we go to uh, two, I'm sorry, three projects where we're gonna be increasing the budget. Uh, one is the long-term control plan. And this is all around, uh, this is really more professional and legal fees and engineering fees related to uh, the long-term control plan, the financial capability analysis for the consent decree work that we're gonna have to do. So what we're doing here is adding a million fifty thousand dollars to that budget to bring it up to three point three million. There's uh, this chlorine scrubber uh, project at the wastewater treatment plant where we're uh, looking to add three hundred and sixty-seven thousand dollars to that budget. And then on the next page, uh, the North Sec uh, North Secondary Clarifier project, um, which is another uh, significant project at the wastewater plant. Um, increasing that from uh, the $2.5 million up to $3 million. And that $3 million number is based on now uh, bids received and we know what the, uh, the escrow account uh, that we need to fund will be. And again, because it's at the wastewater treatment plant, uh, it also, uh, the additional funding is from the city's bulk sewer partners. Then we have uh, five additional projects to add to the list. Um, whoops, I'm sorry. One of those is um, actually a new line for sewer collection system rehabilitation and, and replacement. So this is basically the replacing sewer pipes or repairing them uh, throughout the collection system. And this is a $3 million uh, additional project. Then we have uh, paving at the wastewater treatment plant, uh, Clarifier rehabilitation at the wastewater treatment plant for $1 million. The paving is 500,000. And then two design projects where this, the project is only to fund the preliminary design of uh, the North primary clarifier project and the South screening replacement. And those are for 100,000 and $200,000 combined. All of that all in with all of the deletions of projects, reduction of budget um, for some projects and the adding these new projects in actually results in freeing up an additional about 2.1 million, $2.2 .2 million of sewer fund uh, project funding. And it is not to say that we're saving $2 million because we do have other projects identified uh, to use these funds for. Um, what we don't have yet is good solid uh, construction bid numbers. So as those get, those additional projects get, um, further along in the process, we would come back uh, potentially with additional amendments later on in 2021 or into 2022 uh, for funding of those projects if we either need to add a new project or if we need to amend uh, the budget for a project that's already been approved by council. So again, all of those changes all in uh, results in actually a reduction in total amount budgeted of about $2.2 million. The list on the water side is much simpler. Uh, we're simply taking uh, a little over, uh, well, a, a, about $1.3 million from the South Tank project. And it's primarily reducing uh, the contingency that we had set aside there uh, because that's a, 
project that's underway now, and there should be uh, little of that contingency needed. So taking those funds and putting them to uh, the 2021 payment that we have for replacement of the treatment membranes at the Susquehanna Water Treatment Plant. And those treatment membranes have a 10-year design life. Uh, we put the Susquehanna, the new Susquehanna Water Treatment Plant online in 2010. So we reached the useful life of those membranes. Uh, we had a, uh, the 2020 payment was actually paid for out of the water fund operating budget. We have a 2021 payment of about $1.3 million. And then we have a similar size payment uh, in 2022 that will also be due. Uh, we have not yet decided whether or not that will be something funded out of the operating budget or if that would be a subsequent uh, capital project funded either through bond funds or PenBest loans or something like that. Uh, but at this point, what we're doing is just funding the 2021 uh, uh, payment amount. Uh, so, uh, and that is just a net, you know, there's no uh, net difference here uh, using 1.3 million from the South Water Tank project and putting that right toward the membrane replacement project. And I would uh, ask if Steve has anything to add on any of those. Uh, I just did this, finalize this review actually with uh, his uh, public works team this morning, I had some confusion on my part that they were able to clear up for me. No, I really don't have anything, uh, anything more to say. We're, we're, as Patrick says, we're trying to clarify a number of the uh, sources and, and ends here. And we're moving towards a paradigm where we're in better prepared uh, as we move forward for uh, planning future capital projects and, and uh, investment. All right, thank you very much. Um, I, I don't have any questions just to say to thank you to both of you. Um, and, and Mr. Campbell, I appreciate you being on the call for this too, because I know that this has a lot to do with your work in uh, capital project planning and finding efficiencies and, and the savings that we found through PenVest as well that, that we've been talking about for quite some time. I think this is, uh, this is more evidence to the success of that project that will have uh, capital freed up for future projects of which there will be no shortage of those. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> are there any questions or comments from other members of the committee? Stop that share so we can. Yeah. Or other members of council. I'll just quickly add that the new membranes um, and the need for those will, uh, that your action in moving this forward will be greatly appreciated by Todd and Dan, who you may mm -hmm. have met by watching the State of the City report um, because they very much need these new membranes to continue the plant operations. Um, and so this is, we're on our way. All right. Thank you. All right. Um, not seeing any immediate uh, questions from members of the public, I will entertain a motion uh, to move this to full council on February 9th. So moved. Second. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Thank you. That'll take us to our next item on the agenda. Resolution number six of 2021. This is appointing special counsel for PUC matters. Yeah, I, I, I can speak to this one. Thank uh, you. Sure. So uh, in 2014, um, uh, we retained John Gallagher to serve as PUC counsel. Uh, unfortunately, late last year, I received a phone call from his wife that he had passed away uh, tragically in an automobile accident. Um, uh, John was a solo practitioner, uh, so we need we needed to find a uh, new PUC counsel. Um, obviously, with a water utility and a sewer utility, um, with the budgets they have, having somebody with uh, significant experience in understanding rate cases and public utility commission work uh, law is vitally important. Um, so uh, one of the things that um, this caused us to look at is whether 
uh, what we wanted in terms of the representation. So John was great, um, good friend as well as a very, very good attorney. Um, but what, what we don't want is to be in this situation again, um, where if something happens to the attorney we're primarily dealing with, there's, there's no backup. Um, so it's, it's hard to find good PUC attorneys uh, right now. Um, because most of the good ones go to work in-house for the large utility companies um, because they all keep getting bigger and bigger. Uh, we are not the norm in being a municipal entity that operates uh, utilities. Uh, we interviewed several people, but we ultimately chose uh, um, Courtney Schultz and the firm of Saul Ewing. Um, and again, one of the primary reasons for going with a firm like Saul Ewing, which is a, a very large national law firm, um, based in Pennsylvania, is that they have the backup and support necessary if something were to happen to Courtney. Um, there will be an associate or two that are already involved with our cases. There are other partners who would be able to step in uh, and help as well. Uh, additionally, the firm has significant um, experience in a multitude of areas that might be beneficial to the city at some time in the future to tap into. So we, we are asking, I'm asking city council to appoint Courtney Schultz and the firm of Saul Ewing as special counsel uh, for the city. And I just wanna underscore something that Barry said, which is how much of an anomaly we are. And I'm not sure I fully realize that in terms of uh, the, the very few municipalities that operate uh, water plants. And so Barry and Patrick, I think there's only what, us, Pittsburgh and like one other in the state, is that right? Beth Bethlehem uh, owns their system, but they, they have an operating uh, authority. Uh, and then you go, so you go from city of Pittsburgh, uh, Lancaster City, Bethlehem, uh, down to, um, now I'm blanking on the name of the borough, a little bit further west uh, from here. And that's pretty much it. Uh, and that and borough is you. significantly smaller than the city. Beery also owns- City of Beery, which also, they have an operating authority uh, yeah. for their system as well. But basically there's only three communities in Pennsylvania that own and operate their uh, water systems. Mm -hmm. And so we are, we are really unique in that way. Thank you very much, Barry. I appreciate that review. And uh, obviously this is very important that we get this one done. Are there members of the committee that have any other questions or comments? or other members of council. Great, and I don't see any hands raised from the public. So at this time, I will hear a motion to move this to full council on Tuesday the 9th. So moved. Second. Thank you very much. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Thank you, councilors. And I have, there. there's, a, there's a special fourth item on my agenda that doesn't appear, or that doesn't appear on the agenda that we do need to cover for the finance committee this evening. I don't have a resolution number for it, but it is the water and sewer exoneration for 20, 2020, I guess, or 2021. Uh, exonerating 2020 uh, water and sewer charges for city owned and, and related buildings. Correct, okay. And so we received a list of those those city properties, Patrick, is that correct? Yeah, and I can, uh, I've got the resolution open on my screen here, so I can uh, pop this up. Uh, for any, anybody else uh, watching, this is a, an issue that we handle on an annual basis. Um, and essentially what we're doing is uh, we keep track of the water and sewer charges that are uh, incurred based on the current rates for all city owned property and some uh, what we call city related properties. Um, at, mostly we do it, you know, for leak detection and things like that. Um, and then at the end of the year, we determine the total amount that was built up during the year and we bring it to city council to exonerate those charges because obviously we're not going to charge ourselves for the, the cost. Um, one of the city related ones that I want to point out uh, is the first one that's on the list here, which is the airport fire line. Um, that's been a longstanding agreement with the Lancaster Airport Authority uh, to forgive their costs for their fire line. 
the exchange has been uh, that when called upon, they are able to provide us with their large runway snowblowers. Um, and if you've one, we don't ever you want had to, to say it, we, didn't I, you? I did have to. Say, <laughs> we don't ever want to need those because that means that there are feet of snow falling instead of inches of snow falling. But in the times where we have needed them, after the airport authority is complete with their work, uh, they have really come in handy. Um, the the re almost the rest of these are uh, city parks and city properties. Uh, but the other one that I wanted to point out is the public library. Um, so we, uh, while we don't own that property, uh, it is deemed as part of our uh, in-kind contribution to the uh, to the public library. Uh, so this roughly $4,000 uh, that we'd be exonerating in water and sewer charges helps them uh, in their in-kind uh, contribution sort of calculation uh, when they go to the state uh, or through their sort of state funding model. Um, and again, the rest of these, uh, you know, we've got Central Market on here. While we are not uh, running Central Market, we do own the property. This is an additional, uh, you know, benefit to uh, stand holders and the Central Market Trust. Um, and then the uh, Mary Kay Dano Animal Shelter, uh, which is run, operated by the Pennsylvania uh, SPCA, but the city owns the property. Again, this is uh, part of the uh, basically in-kind contribution of the city toward that operation. So the total uh, water uh, charges that would be exonerated is $50,817. Uh, total sewer uh, that would be exonerated is 46,780 for a total of 97,598. Perfect. Thanks for going over that, Patrick. Sure. I don't have anything else to add to the members of the committee or council. Right. I do have a question on this last uh, item on the finance committee. Does it have to be added to the agenda? Do we vote on it or? Um, that's a good question, Bernie, for committee meetings. I, I don't know. I don't know. I defer to Barry on that, but I don't think that it needs to for uh, committee meetings. Okay. No, I mean, I think you're okay. It's a matter that came up before council. Uh, at before the committee, you've got your committee meetings advertised for general purposes. So I, I think you're fine to move it to uh, move it forward to regular council. Thank you for keeping us on this, Councilor Soto. <laughs> Appreciate sometimes, it. Sometimes you never know. You let it slide, and before you know it, you read about it. Exactly. Uh, and so I don't see any members of the public waving their hand. Oh, I do actually. Uh, Chris looks like from LNP. Uh, Councillor Soto, I can assure you, you wouldn't be reading about that one. Uh, <laughs> and I'm on, I'm on the board of the Pennsylvania Freedom of Information Coalition. You're not taking any final action. You're just moving it to an agenda. Uh, it, it's not for me to take Barry's spot and, and give you legal advice, but you won't be reading about it. You're, you're cool Thank by you, me. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. Good reassurance. <laughs> Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Okay, um, so with that, I will hear a motion to move this resolution to full council on February 9th. So moved. Second. And I will assure you that it will appear on that agenda. All in favor? Aye. All right, well, that does now conclude my committee meeting, Mr. President. All right, thank you, Councillor Bake. Um, that moves us tonight to the Committee of the Whole. Um, I'm gonna let uh, everybody know that we're actually not going to consider um, the Black History Month resolution uh, this evening. Um, and I'll just uh, ask for your uh, allowance in, um, in bringing it to the to the council agenda um, next week, since there's no actual legislative action or effect associated um, with it, but we do have um, a resolution that was brought to us by Councillor Diaz. That's resolution number five, 2021, um, opposing wildlife killing contest. Councillor Diaz, can you um, let us know, or is there somebody here? Um, Oh, yes. Um, thank you, Mr. President. We have um, 
Let's see who's in the room first. <laughs> the Pennsylvania um, hum Humane um, Society, Kristen Terulo, um, if you want to bring her in so she can um, speak to that. And I, I don't know who else is up here. Yeah. Yeah, so if we can have her. Uh, Kristen, you're I'm muted. Here. Oh, there you go. Oh, yeah. there you go. <laughs> Hello. You all have so, so many inspiring things happening. Thank you. Um, so, uh, Councillor Diaz brought us this uh, resolution. Um, I see Sam, is that Janina I see? Probably. You're muted, Janina. <laughs> yes, hi. Hey. There Sorry, this is the wrong name there. I have to correct that. So it goes. Um, <laughs> well, why don't you uh, tell us about the, the resolution we're considering moving forward to council? Sure. And um, Councillor Diaz, is. Um, are we able to play the video clip or... Um... Amber? Yeah, you should be able to. Um, you can just share your screen. Okay, let me see. Um, I might have to okay I'll, I'll, I'll try to let me see if I can do this share okay Oh, yeah. I guess they're the ones that people don't want to keep. It's not useful. We throw them in the dumpster. Come on, we're All right. Um, that was okay. Uh, sorry. Yes. Yeah. Sorry. This is, and and I, um, I'm sorry. I had that. I wasn't. Um, where I was going to be sharing my screen. So um, prior to that, um, um, that threw me off just a little bit. Uh, this is a very graphic video and, you know, it was difficult to watch, but it's also important because it is representative of what is happening in our state. And after the killing contests are over, uh, these are for cash and prizes and the participants will gather to weigh who, what they competed for. It could be the targeted species, coyote, foxes, bobcat. It could be um, they'll weigh and count the bodies. They're going to pose for photos and celebrate. Um, and as they also mentioned, these animals are typically dumped after the event. And why I'm bringing this to council today is that Pennsylvania has more killing contests in our state besides only behind Texas and Oklahoma, and some of the nation's largest. And we had six contests that were canceled in the state due to COVID-19, but there's still 24 contests being held in January and February alone. And one of them was in Mount Joy, Pennsylvania, in Lancaster County. And 
that is the reason that we are uh, you know, here today is to talk very briefly about uh, states that have, there have been seven states that have outlawed killing contest and resolutions are what really help to garner the support and create the public awareness for the issue. And that's why we're working with counties and cities in Pennsylvania that have been to passing these resolutions. Uh, Pittsburgh City Council resolution, as well as the five boroughs surrounding the city, uh, the mayor's enacted proclamations in opposition to these contests, as well as um, Carlisle Borough. And they're also um, passing a state, they're encouraging a statewide ban that would pass as well. And given this is a priority issue for our organization, we're working with the bipartisan, bicameral animal protection caucus on a state level, where we're gonna be working on a sign on letter from legislators to show support to the Pennsylvania Game Commission that we wanna see a ban to these you know, cruel sporting um, wasteful killing contest. And that is something that the Pennsylvania Game Commission did request was to see that there's support from the legislature for them to enact a ban that would uh, stop these from happening in the state. And so we really appreciate council's consideration to pass this resolution, which would oppose wildlife killing contests in our state and encourage a statewide ban. Um, with that, I'll hand it over to Sarah and Jonina, who we're going to talk about this issue as well. Thanks. Hi. Uh, you said it so well, Kristen. Thank you for having us, uh, Lancaster City Council. Um, we just want to reiterate what Kristen said. Uh, just to be clear, this resolution would help um, show that uh, these killing contests are not consistent with the public opinion um, of these sort of outmoded and antiquated ways of uh, interacting with animals and wildlife. Um, it would help to encourage the statewide ban that will help Pennsylvania kind of step into the current world that we live in and help us, uh, like states like Arizona, California, Colorado, Massachusetts, et cetera. Um, those are states that have already passed these bans. And why would they do that? It's because there's no scientific evidence as you saw and heard Kristen say, you might hear someone raise a concern that coyotes could kill their dog or interfere with agriculture, but there's absolutely no validity to that. And I do wanna read this quote, if that's okay, from the Pennsylvania Game Commission about this issue, that there is no scientific need to slaughter uh, coyotes in these ways um, or other uh, peak top carnivores. <clears throat> After decades of using predator control, such as paying bounties or these killing contests, with no effect and the emergence of wildlife management as a science, the agency finally accepted the reality that predator control does not work. And the science is really interesting. I could tell you all about it, but it is late. Um, <laughs> but it has to do with sort of like reckless killing um, without an ethical consideration of a predator uh, at the end of a, of a gun, there is actually maybe briefly a decrease in the number of coyotes or predators, um, but there's then um, a surplus. The species responds with an ultimate increase in numbers. And it's not the way to interact with wildlife if you care about um, conservation and management. So, we should definitely pass this resolution <laughs> is what we think. We think it's so clear. Do you, does anyone have any questions? Anything else we could speak to? I have a quick question, if I may. Um, so you mentioned that there is statewide legislative action around this. And I'm just curious if there's current legislation pending, uh, like current bills that maybe should be added to this language. Like, you know, specifically like we support we resolve that we support this particular piece of legislation. Wow, that is a great question. Um, and, and I did wanna um, just also mention the video, the, the investigation video that put at the beginning was actually from a, a killing contest in New York. All, it covered all of New York state as well as six Pennsylvania counties. So that's the reason that we uh, showed that. But as far as um, in the legislature, we are hoping to go through the game commission versus the legislative route on this, but the Animal Protection Caucus is supportive of this. So they're looking at creative ways, um, like a sign on le letter to show support for uh, the game commission to ban these. 
I'll definitely keep council member Diaz uh, posted if there's new um, legislation, if we do decide to go that route. Great question. And thank you, because that's what the Humane Society does so well. It's kind of like, it's this long arc of uh, catching up to where our state will get. We think it's just a matter of time, um, but these resolutions just help for that bill to exist in the future. And, and I just want to add that we all, we're here taking space from our wildlife. If we continue killing our wildlife, we're not gonna have very much to look at. You know, when you're walking down a park, you see the squirrels and you see the birds. You know, um, sometimes even in certain areas in the city that's considered like the um, annex, you see a fox or you see a deer. Do you really want to walk down the path and not be able to see anything that, um, you know, brings out nature? And that's where I am an advocate and, I think Kristen and, <laughs> and Jonani um, knows that, you know, I go up there to Harrisburg and lobby for our, for our nature, for our wildlife and any animal, because, you know, it would be boring not to have a dog or a cat, you know, because they, they're going to use them as co a contest too and kill them. So, you know, it's really important to continue advocating. I, I definitely feel that, you know, we share their space. So, that's why I brought this forward and I'm proud of always being the advocate for the Humane um, uh, PA. And I just wanted to add that. Thank you, Councillor Diaz. Um, and thank you, Kristen, Janina and Sarah. Um, any other uh, council comments or questions on the uh, proposed resolution? Um, any from the public? Okay, um, with that, I will hear a motion to move this forward to full council next week. So move. Second. All right, we have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right, um, so we will consider this um, at our full council meeting um, next week where it will be available for passage as a resolution. Um, uh, Jonina, Sarah, Kristen, thank you for your time. Councillor Diaz, thank you for uh, for bringing this forward. Thank you. All right, um, Mr. Harris. Yes, Mr. President. Uh, clerk's report. Uh, so I did submit this to you in writing, but just a couple of highlights here. Um, in the last month, I have compiled the uh, the 2020 record book for council, and that is now with the binder. Um, all of your the ordinances, resolutions, minutes, agendas that we were dealing with last year, such as it was. Uh, I've organized the uh, the meetings. Um, and the pages and began to put the framework together for 2021. Um, I attended training for the city's, the city's data management initiative and for the, uh, the language access telephone service. I um, facilitated um, providing a letter of support for HDC on behalf of the council president. Um, I researched I researched the uh, the city code on behalf of a mayor in Wyoming, who is who has gotten their first uh, Amish residence and was wanted to see if we had a uh, ordinance on stabling of horses. <laughs> Everybody, stop what you're doing and look at the mayor's face. <laughs> that they picked up the phone and called the city of Lancaster, of course. Oh, yeah. Naturally. <laughs> um, I supplied the- uh, In the 1800s, we did have a policy on stabling horses, but not today. Yes. Oh, fascinating. That's a good one, Bernie. Keep that one. <laughs> I, I told her that, you know, we might have a, a legacy ordinance there that so I had to do some research to find out if we still did. Um, I supplied uh, a, uh, a legal notice for our 2021 meeting 
notice to the uh, the Harrisburg City Clerk. We wanted to see our um, our wording for how we're complying with the uh, the state's virtual meetings law. Um, I supplied a 1987 ordinance for a constituent. Um, statements of financial interest. Uh, I have delivered to you your W-2s and statements of financial interest, and I've begun collecting those. Uh, I have contacted a couple of the city directors so far. I need to get more of those emails out and asking for uh, city directors to supply statements of financial interest, which we do every year. Um, I attended the parking authority meeting, sent you a summary of that. I organized uh, two Zoom discussions. Um, and I delivered mail. So some of the things I've done the last month. Thank you, Bernie. Thank you. We're going to put you on a Wheaties box, man. It's <laughs> um, honestly, my biggest takeaway uh, from that is that I love that we're, we are sought as a model all the way from, you know, Harrisburg to Wyoming. That's, that makes me feel special. So Thank you for for letting us um, for letting us know that. Also, interestingly enough, just because you mentioned um, a legacy ordinances on the Amish, uh, something I discovered when I was in Councillor uh, Craig's role um, uh, on the County Planning Commission is that a number of zoning ordinances throughout the throughout Lancaster County require um, uh, commercially zoned a lot to have a certain number of hitching posts for every vehicle parking space that they have, um, which is just a lovely little uh, quirk of living in Lancaster County. Um, maybe, maybe we can return hitching posts to downtown. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> but then you got to supply the cleaning detail. <laughs> Only right. if we get rid of all the cars. Nice trade. <laughs> Some of us might take you up on that, Mayor. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> Good luck. Right? Um, all right, y'all. Uh, thanks for hanging in. Since it is now 8.15, I will hear a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. second. We have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Uh, we are adjourned. Have a good night, everyone. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye, everyone. Patrick, check your email. Yeah, I saw it. <laughs> no emergency continued.